So how are you? Um, let's see, you're in, you're in Bandle now? Yeah, right now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, oh. um, just well, of course, with, uh, I don't know how you, you say that in, uh, in English, confinement? Well, lockdown, lockdown. Comment? With the lockdown. Anyway, ah, oui. with confinement. the confinement. Confinement, same thing. We don't have the choice. Well, it's, I think it's a little bit less strict here. Um, yeah. But uh, it's the same idea. And for, for us in California, it's until May 3rd. May, May 11th. May 11th. Yeah. May the 11th. Macron just announced that uh, yesterday, right? Yeah. yeah. So That's how it. is that going to affect you at the domain very much? Um, I don't know. Um, I think the main problem is uh, is for restaurants, especially uh, restaurants, because they are sure to be uh, closed t uh, till uh, mid July. Okay. So it's very very long. I don't think that a lot of them are going to recover after that. So yeah. it's a, it's a very very big deal for us. Honestly, uh, with the foreign market, the export market uh, it should be. Uh, a balance. It's it's still hard. It's not very hard for to organize the work, but it's still hard for the for the commercial aspect. Right. But, uh, for the work, it's quite okay with the team. It's okay. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I expect it to be uh, challenging here as well. Everywhere, yeah. where restaurants are closed and things are starting to move yeah. really slowly. Um, and hopefully over the summer. And but uh, yeah. we, we hope don't, so. Don't really know. <laughs> we're we're all in it together. Um, okay, yeah. so we have 135 people watching us. So just to introduce myself, I'm Anthony Lynch. I'm with Daniel Ravier of Domaine Tempier. Um, mm -hmm. So Daniel, uh, everybody knows Tempier, but maybe maybe they don't know you because you you've been there since 2000. But you're a, you're a discreet man, except for when you uh, work the market. Maybe um, maybe people don't know you very well. So you are not from from Provence originally. No, no, no. Originally, I'm from the Alps. I grew up uh, in a farm, and my father was uh, originally from Savoie. My mother, too. My father, for those who are familiar with uh, wines from Savoie, my father is from uh, close to Apromont, and he was having wines in in the, the appellation Apromont. Mm -hmm. And my mother is from Arbin, and her family uh, was having vines uh, in Arbin, uh, which is the local uh, place, the, the, the best place for Mondeuse in Savoie. Okay. And uh, we, we still have on both sides uh, cousins that are driving vines of my parents. And I don't want to have anything to, to I don't want to uh, be in the middle with them. So they do job, they do everything, and it's, uh, it's nice. But my father, you know, my, the fact is that my father was having these vines. He grew up uh, driving vines, but, but also cows. And uh, he spent his whole time, all life uh, with cow. Uh, okay. Cow was his, his purpose. So, <laughs> but when I went to school, following him in a way, uh, when I went to school, we had, uh, luckily we had, um, how could I say that? We had the uh, biology and, and uh, viticulture uh, introduction thought when I was in the uh, agronomic school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that was very, very interesting. And second point, to be honest, I already knew my wife at that time, and she was from the South, and the school about oenology was in the South. So school of what? Of school of uh, oenology and agronomy okay. was in Montpellier. It, the okay. school was in Montpellier. So okay. I went to Montpellier. And, uh, and then started to work, uh, you know, accidentally because of friends in, in, uh, in Provence. And again, accidentally uh, coming very, very, uh, you know, just knocking on the door at Domenot in the in eighty seven. I worked there for a couple of months and then went to the army, came back because Jean Daniel wanted me to, to, to come back and uh, he gave me the sort of virus of Mondor and I stayed in Mondor. I worked for uh, ten years in between uh, nineteen ninety and two thousand. I worked for ten years in a small domain called Domaine de Souvio. Mm -hmm. And uh, luckily enough, then, uh, that François and Jean-Marie uh, asked me, uh, would you like to come and join Domaine Pompier? I said, well, why not? But 
what to do, you know. I thought that they were keeping going on and say, you have to run the property. I said, whoa, uh, yeah, why not? <laughs> and that's, that's the way it, 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 it came, you know. I, I wasn't, um, how could I say that? I wasn't, um, I didn't have any, any career plan. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I should have left to you a very, uh, very, well, early in, in, in a way. But uh, if I have quit to you uh, at that time, uh, the, the Perros family wouldn't have hired me. So I, I was lucky enough to, to stay in New York. And very, very lucky when joining Tonky because I, I had the feeling of, uh, you know, sort of changing the galaxy. Uh, that was not the same world of uh-huh. Definitely. You, were you, uh, you were very familiar with the, with the domain and its wines back then? Was it a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. a fan, of course, but the, you, you know that at that time, you know, you, we know the history, we know how uh, influence Lucien has been. He has been, he's considered a, a bit like the father of Bandol, um, yeah. because he has been buried on the property. If right. I has to be buried, I'm not going to work. <laughs> so, it shows that Lucien was a very, very, very important character of the region. And... Um, very, very focused on, on the appellation and on, on the domain. So, of course, all of us, we knew him as uh, sort of the godfather of the appellation in a way. Mm-hmm. And um, that was very, very important. So, of course, I knew the domain Templier because everybody knows the domain Templier when you work here around, for, for sure. So, I, I can't imagine what it's like stepping into that role with the, the history of, uh, you know, Lucien and his sons having having been there in the past must be a lot of pressure, but also um, kind of uh, how do you how do you I would, that? Uh, you know my my feeling was that uh, um, uh, I knew the reputation I knew uh, uh, that the basics were there I knew that I'm not a, a great specialist I'm not very very good for for uh, for how do you say that com- commercial aspects. And I know that I knew that the reputation of Pompeii was that good that it may help. Of course, that at that period there were some um, details to 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 refix in a way, but things were the basics were there. Okay. Crazy the one, good way, good uh, good rules to 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 run the property. Uh, everything was there. You just have to to you know the details to move a little bit. And so I didn't. Uh, how could I say that? I didn't uh, have the feeling that uh, uh, I would be overwhelmed by something. I knew it was very, very big. Uh, I was very humble when joining the, the property. And anyway, when you work at Tampier, it makes you humble. Because mm-hmm. when you taste the ones that are 30, 40, 50 years old, and when you taste the one, and you say, wow, eh, hopefully the ones we are making are going to, to last that long. And right. stay the, so, so so balanced and so fresh, so it makes you humble. Whatever happened if, when you work there? Right, I see. I see. So you've been there for twenty years, which is very impressive yeah. already. It seems like it's yeah. probably gone by really quickly. Uh, but, yeah, exactly. Um, you, so you've seen. Um, let's see. You've seen. Uh, there was a recession. There was. Uh, now we have an, a pandemic. You, there were tariffs. And you're also dealing with climate change. So uh, oh, it, hasn't, it wasn't just step in and keep doing what they've been doing. You, you've had to adapt the whole time um, to different world events exactly. and global events. Um, one, know, one of the- my, my first trip in the U.S. was November 2001. So uh, my first trip for Tampier Tampier in the U.S. was November 2001. So I do remember what you, what you, you imagine about... Uh, because, you know, without crossing the sea, without crossing the ocean, uh, it looks like something very important in the U.S., but you couldn't, you couldn't fix it in your mind. Mm-hmm. When being there, especially in New York, wow, you say, well, that's it. Uh, that was, a, that was a, I think, as you mentioned, all these small details, you have the, the global um, um, atmosphere around you. And yeah. then you have the big deal, the big deal, which is global warming for us, technically speaking. Mm-hmm. And that's probably the, the hardest to adapt. The rest, well, that's life and that's it. We have to, we have to, 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 to deal with it. 
Uh -huh. But uh, the global one is a bit harder because you make decisions now and decisions you are taking now are supposed to last for uh, 40, 50 years oh, wow. that are coming. And uh, of course, uh, if you listen to the, the people that are in charge of uh, uh, exploring the, the, the future of our climate, you say, mm -hmm. well, that's pretty hard to know what's going to happen. Right. Because you know, choosing the rootstock, choosing what kind of... Uh, Good, uh, vines you are going to use, uh, the way you are going to prune, the, the way you are going to drive the vines, all these details are very, very complex. And of course, uh, you are making a bet on the future, saying, well, this is going to be a to when the vines are going to reach a decent age that we are looking for. So, yeah, that's probably the hardest for me. So it's even even since you arrived in the in the last twenty years, how has your perspective on that changed? Because I know it's, I mean, the vintages yeah. are are warmer, but they're also more erratic. You have um, like years like twenty eighteen yeah. that are really rainy, and then you have twenty seventeen and twenty nineteen that are really dry. It's never, yeah. and now you have frost this year, which you said it was the first time since nineteen ninety one. No, that's it. Yeah. First time since nineteen ninety one, and that was. Um, um, Really surprising for us because that was very early. Uh, we the vines we had. I, I guess it's the same in, in the U.S. But our our winter was not cold at all, mm -hmm. and uh, because of that, the vines started very early. We were about more than three weeks in advance, mm -hmm. because normally frost on the end of March is not that much of a deal. Right. It? So it's not. It should be okay. Uh, the last time well, the, in 2000. Uh, sorry, in uh, 1991. The, the first one on, on 26th or 28th of, uh, of April. Okay. So that was a month later. Oh, wow. And um, so, so it's, a, it's a very big difference. And we are not used to it. Too. So we are lucky. I don't, I don't want to complain about that. You know, if you, if you listen to other people in, in the Bordeaux, Bordeaux region or sure. in the Loire Valley, sure. of course, where it's really, really uh, 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 a very, very big problem. Uh, no, for us it happens not that often. We are lucky. We are lucky. Mm -hmm. Drought is a bit more uh, question for us. That could be a big issue. Yeah, yeah, it could be a big one in the future. I guess. I guess the, the amount of water is still a bit lower. It's mm -hmm. declining, and then the the way it spread all over the year is changing, and we have a very very uh, a longer and longer period of dry season during right. the, the summer. Uh, that's what seemed, you know. To give you an idea, when I first started to work in Mandel in the eight, in the late eight, the old guys told me, "Well, listen, we never start harvesting before the fifteenth of September." Oh wow! And I went back to the figures of, of on the cellar books at Tampier, mm -hmm. and in the sixties and the seventies, they never started harvesting before the twenty fifth of September. Wow! <laughs> in in, in, in two thousand and seventeen, we finished on the twelfth of September. Last year we finished on the on the 21st or something like this of September, so it means that we are at least at least as an average three weeks earlier than what we were in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the 90s, which is and totally crazy. How does the the shortened growing cycle affect the the maturities of the grapes? Um, my feeling is that you may remember about these old wines of Bondo. Well, you're a bit too young. Tony, of course, but uh, I, was, I was tasting a little wine back from, then, but my memory isn't. From, from the eighties at Tampier, they were some, at Tampier and in Mandol, maybe less than Tampier than in the other. Some of the wines were very aggressive, the tannins more that could show a very, very uh, rustic aspect. And in the vintages that were slightly uh, ripe, uh, the, 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 the feeling of this uh, uh, sharpness and aggressivity of Mourvedre was very, very heavy when the wines were young, but they had the ability, ability of aging at mm -hmm. the same time. Probably global warming had helped us a little bit to, uh, to run the, 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 the tannins of the moment and make, okay. make it a little bit more approachable. But in uh -huh. the same time, using part of the acidity, you, you, you know, it's always question of We have gained something, the wines are probably a little bit more approachable when young. Mm -hmm. Do they have the same ability of aging now, right now? I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. It seems to be the case when you see the wines and how, how they are evolving. But 
it's not exactly the same, to totally the same style of wine. I see. And well, I, I, the thing is, is that we, we keep the identity of Tampier, but it's moving, it's moving because of, of, of the weather. And of course, okay. Bondol couldn't move up north, so we have to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So um, I, I don't know if this is a commonly known fact about Tompier, but uh, Tompier is now 100% biodynamic, correct? Yeah, that's it, yeah. Every, so uh, all, the, all, the, all the domain. You, you converted to biodynamics a few years ago, I think. I was just wondering why, um, what was the goal of that transition and what did it mean? What kind of changes did you have to make compared to how it, the way you were working previously? Um, the domain has always been organic. That was a key, uh, a key for Lucien. Lucien thought that you couldn't make a wine if you weren't paying a minimum of respect back to the terroir. Mm -hmm. So he said, listen, these products are not good for us. We are not going to use them. That's it. So organic, even if we didn't make any uh, certification at that time, uh, we were, uh, the, the domain was, was organic. And then when we see this global warming and when, um, also, you know, when tasting wines, in, in thanks to your father, thanks to other guys like, like it, when I was tasting wines and, and I um, said, oh, what's that? How could it be like this? And you go and visit the, 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 the producers and they were saying, well, we are doing that and that and that and that. Okay, I understand that. And then when ending, they were saying, and we are biodynamic. So I said, listen, I must understand that. So we decided to, to go a bit deeper in, in biodynamic and see what we could do. At the beginning, honestly, that was not very easy because the team in the vineyards, they weren't sort of old fashioned and they didn't want to change right. their habits. So we keep, I was just, I just said them, listen, we are going to use herbal tea, but we were in biodynamic. And then in 2010 and 2011, we, this guy retired. Uh, Joseph and Jean-Pierre, and we had a new team coming in, and I said, listen, I want to do that in the vineyards. Bernard and the Cellar, we were already uh, applying the calendar, but you can't say, you know, biodynamic is a little bit more about vineyards than about cellar. Right. So uh, we, in, in 2011, we started to, to think about that very, very deeply, and we moved to biodynamic in 2012 and 2013. Okay. You know, moving and... Um, um, for me, the that was also you know of course to uh, to make life uh, our soils a bit more lively of course uh -huh. and uh, to give more better conditions for the plant to grow and for the vines to grow uh, to grow up and of course being balanced a little bit more so less problems and all that uh, that uh, different aspects. But also that was you are right that was also for me a good mean to balance the the effect of global warming mm -hmm. because what I my feeling about wines uh, coming from vines uh, driven with biodynamic was the, uh, run by biodynamic was the fact that the the the, the, the wines were really uh, um, more often balanced and with this sort of uh, saltiness and freshness you know mm -hmm. in say French yeah. you know when you have on the on the on the tongue you and the you, you need to have some more and it's easy to drink. All right. And uh, that was, of course, for us, a, a, good, uh, a good way to balance global warming too, to my opinion. Yeah. yeah. I see a lot of examples of it. Like uh, if you look in Corsica with uh, Jean-Charles Abatucci, uh, Yves Canarelli, who are both biodynamic in a, in a very hot climate and making really uh, refreshing wines. Or uh, in the long dock, like uh, the Ravai brothers, uh, uh, it would be the best, one of the best Syrah or even the best Syrah in the South. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right. And it's, it's amazing in, in these really hot climates, how this biodynamic farming can, over the course of several years, uh, we've noticed, I mean, mm -hmm. from tasting these wines each year, we notice a transformation. They, they, they become fresher, they become more livelier. They, um, yeah. it's, it's a, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, and, you know, we, I don't like to prescribe to any sort of philosophy unless there is a, a result that you can taste. And with biodynamics, when you taste these contrasting examples, it's, it's really quite fascinating. So, um, you know, my, my, in theory, in theory, 
my background is very, very scientific and quite high. So when first time I heard about biodynamic, first time I go into biodynamic, uh, reading what uh, Steiner was saying, uh, that was a bit of a mess for me. You know, I said, "Come on, <laughs> yeah. you, uh, you know, it's like it's Merlin, it's Merlin, uh, it's it's powder, and that." Uh, and but then, of course, I was a bit pragmatic, a bit like uh, I think you say also Saint, Saint Thomas, you know, uh, just do it and see what what we 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 split parcels in two halves. And we did it on one side and not on the other side, and we moved everything to the to biodynamic because for us that was obvious. obvious. But saying that, yeah. I don't want to uh, I don't want to uh, to ignore the fact that uh, the the guys that are doing that, if they do believe, it, it has probably uh, an effect the the effect of the operator on the experiment, you know. So. Uh, I don't know, but the fact it is that it has changed a lot of things, and we have seen the changes first, of course, on the soils, secondary into the vines. And maybe, maybe I don't know. You can't judge. I don't know if it's the effect of the, the vintages or whatever you know. But maybe we, we could see some changes also into the, into the vines. But for sure, we have seen them in the soils and on the vines. Okay, fantastic. Um, you, you said something earlier that. That was really interesting that um, Tampier has always been organic and it was re really important uh, for Lucien to treat yeah. the terroir with respect. So I think um, from, from the very start, uh, so you said farming's always been organic. Um, yeah. Lucien never filtered his wines. He never um, inoculated with yeast. He always used very low sulfur doses. I mean, yeah. n now we talk about natural wine, but that wasn't that wasn't what he was trying to do. He was trying to make the most honest representation of, of uh, his terroir. And, um, and it's, you know, he was one of the precursors, um, even though Tampier is rarely mentioned in the same, you know, same breath as like the Beaujolais people and the Loire people who are making natural wines. Um, but Tampier has always worked that way and, and you continue to, to work that way. So um, you're, you're still not filtering your reds, you're using really low sulfur doses and your wines are alive. And that's, that's something I love about them. Um, has, has that philosophy changed at all since, since you joined the domain? Uh, no, for me, you know, when I came in, I, I, I remember the, the funny thing is that uh, Jean-Marie told me, well, listen, after one month I was there, Jean-Marie said to me, well, listen, you have, understand, uh, you have understood how it worked. So, it's okay, I'm leaving. I said, come on, come on, oh, I, I need you. I need you to be there. And he said, no, you know, you, you have understand, you have understood how it's working. It's okay. You can, you can deal with it. And I do remember some, sometimes, you know, where um, they, they, they were saying, uh, some people were coming and saying, well, listen, you should do that and you should do that. Or even sometimes uh, uh, members of the family coming and, and saying, well, maybe we should do that. And I was turning myself to Bernard, it's our master that has worked for a long, long time with Lucien. And I, I was saying, would you, would you have done that with Lucien? And Bernard was saying, uh, no. So I said, no, we don't do that. No, the right. idea was just to preserve what has been done before. Of course, of course, global warming has changed things. For example, for Rosé, you know, uh, Malo or not Malo, Mm. Malo was always achieved on the rosé, mm -hmm. always. And uh, in the 2000, the first vintage of 2000, I keep going on this way. And 2007 was a very low uh, acidity, uh, not a, a big level of malic, and you had to wait or not uh, till the Malo is, is finished. And I said, well, listen, what can we do? And so we decided to block the Malo. And since we have part of the Malo that is the chill and part that is not the chill, and then we mix everything for the rosé. Mm -hmm. You know that the rosé is, uh, is very, very tricky things. For me, it's right. the hardest to produce. Making a rosé is very Making a rosé is very, very easy. Making a good one, I'd like to know. And, there, uh, I, I know there are a lot of bad ones. <laughs> that's the very, the very hard point, of course. Uh, but the idea was to keep the identity of Tampier. And to be honest, also, it's easy. It's easy for me because, you know, after uh, we were having a discussion with Jennifer, our cellar master, this afternoon, and she said something very true. She said, listen, when you, when you, you put La Tourtine in the tank for the vinification, after, after three days, you know, it's La Tourtine. You don't have to 
mm. to put questions to them to know oh no it's not looking at this you smell it you taste it and you say well look this is that protein this is full of sugar but you know this is that protein so um, that's why I was saying to you that it makes you very humble to work at Tampier because okay. my feeling is that uh, well it's working on its own you know uh, it's going on that's if you if you pay respect to the terroir you will have the result don't worry it's coming on it's coming on and in the same time um, it make you it makes you humble also as I was mentioning because when you taste the wines from the 80s and mm -hmm. you see how balanced and how fresh they are and more important for me uh, how lively they are you know they have this, this sort of vibration that you don't find that much often on all wines you know uh -huh. it's so uh, sort of uh, yeah i think for me it's really like a vibration you have the feeling that the wine is totally a uh, 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 livestock you know it's, it's yeah. full of life it's moving it's changing of course but it's full of life it's not like some of these big ones that you could take some wines that are very, very impressive you could you could speak a lot of um, uh, descriptives, you know, saying well, right. this is a bit like you could smell uh, blah, blah, this kind of blah blah, blah 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 blah. But at the end, you don't have the energy in the wine. Whereas sure. when you taste the old Pompier and some, of course, lots of other wines, uh, you 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 have that feeling. For me, it's really really impressive, and it makes you humble because of that. When you say you see that background, you say, oh, listen, you don't have to mix, you don't have to mix up everything. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you screw it up. It's very, very important. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, you mentioned the rosé, and that made me curious. Yeah. What, why do you think, so Tampier is, it, it, when, um, when my dad started importing it, it was one of the first, it was in the late 70s, and I think it's one of the longest running rosés to be imported in the U.S. on a continuous basis. One of the first and one of the most uh, consistent. And um, mm -hmm. it's often cited as one of the, one of the most special rosés being made. So what makes... Bondol and specifically Tampier, such a great terroir for, for rosé. Haha. Um, I think it's a combination in between the terroir, as you mentioned, uh, close to the sea, keeping some fresh net, uh, uh, and Mourvel. Mourvel is our key grape, but never alone. We are in the town, so we must keep the idea of blending. It is very, very important for me. Uh, uh, Mourvedre as a key grape and majority as a uh, as a majority, but always completed with something, um, and that that's probably part of the the, the 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 reason. Why I'm saying that it's also because of the terroir is um, the way we are making rosé. I think they could age for a long, 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 long time, and we had such surprises about that in the cellar at Tampier with old bottles, and uh, that were just really, really impressive. You know, we don't. If we are speaking uh, technically in the vinification and in the aging, you have the feeling that nothing is done on the rosé for aging, and they are doing very well. Mm -hmm. So it's even question, questioning about the, the reds. You know, right. we have these uh, these big fruit that are very, very important. We want to keep going on the same way, always uh, aging the wines for a long time in these big big vats. And that's very very important. But then on the other end, you have the rosé that is made uh, uh, out of tank, uh, very, very classically. But, uh, right. And, and it's aging very, very well. So it's always surprising for me. Right. And as I mentioned, the problem is that uh, uh, making rosé is easy in the way that with technical means that we do have now, mm -hmm. you can, uh, you can uh, hide the default or the mist that you have from the vine, okay. technically, but it doesn't last. It never lasts when when, when right. and when yes. aging. Mm -hmm. So I guess that this is you know this this combination what what has been done into the vineyards and and uh, and probably the terroir too that is changing the proximity of the scene. Okay, could help of course. Yeah, because when you are familiar with the wines from Cassis. You can see and uh, uh, side to her white wines, and you could see like uh, uh, Jonathan at Cro Saint Magdalene is yeah. making fresh wines, crazy wines, and yeah. I get that proximity of the sea is having a very very big effect because the acidity is not that high. So, right. 
it's uh, the freshness comes more from the minerality or salinity yeah. than acidity. I think so. When when you when you're working properly your vines, you give them the the the, the means to 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 dig, you know, with their roots quite profoundly. You will yeah. have the effect uh, for sure. Okay. Well, let's uh let's move into red wine since um yeah. I have the bottle right here. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, I might as well. Uh, <laughs> Might as well pour a glass. <laughs> yeah, same for me. It's 11.30, it's time. <laughs> yeah. Poor Lou. I didn't open it for you, so I need to open the bottle first. Okay, well, I'll wait for you. <laughs> so this is this is the 2017 Cuvée Classique, which is uh, titled Pour Lou in honor of her 100 year birthday. Very, very important. Lulu is still living. She was, I saw her this morning and this afternoon on the, on the swing. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Getting her exercise. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, she, she's just fabulous. And of course, we, we needed to pay a minimum of tribute to Lulu because Lucien was the key guy for the Appellation, for Round. But for Tampier, what she has done when receiving all these uh, people, you know, uh, of course, they were having seven children, so that was a lot of people on the table, but they had no problem to add two places or two plates and, and say, well, you have time, just stay with us and have lunch with us. And, mm -hmm. and Lulu was and is still a cook, of course. Yeah. So uh, we are very, very lucky to still have her. And she's a funny, she's a funny lady, as you know. <laughs> yeah, she's like a grandmother to me. But it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it really she's defines... Cooking. Tampier, I mean, it's it's Lucien and Lulu in their in their character, um, th their generosity, and like you said, it's just stay for lunch. We have an extra plate, we have an extra seat for you. It's um it's something that in the wines too. It's there's this generosity and this this warmth that is it's that for me that's more that goes beyond anything about the vinification or the or the terroir. It's just this 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 soul, yeah. the spirit of the wine yeah. is completely based in you know in, in Lucien and Lulu's personalities. Yeah, often we say, uh, we say, you know, that uh, it's, um, you could taste the best wine in the world if you are, if you're tasting it and drinking it with bastards, it's not going that, to be that good. So, <laughs> and, and that's the truth. I mean, wine is about, uh, is about sharing things, you know, about uh, community and it's yeah. very, very important to, to, to do that. And Lucien and Lulu, they were really, really, uh, more than concerned, it's not a question of being concerned. That was there. That was that was coming from the inside. You know, that was mm. really, really deeply uh, uh, linked in what they are. That's the way they are. That's all. Yeah. And uh, let's share. Let's share something wine and, and some food and, and some time, some fun, of course. Because if you want to listen to uh, some, uh, how do you say, the uh, blague, the salas, the Lulu, Lulu's dirty jokes. Yeah, she, that's it. She's, uh, she's, she's known for her joke jokes. Uh, not, yeah, she not appropriate for Instagram Live, unfortunately. We'll have to make a, a an uh, R-rated or X-rated channel for <laughs> for that. <laughs> All right, so let's raise raise a glass to Lulu, and we can make yeah. it to the we can share wine, but even if we're kind of alone. We're, we're not alone, so. Yeah, exactly. That's a good way to share it. Today. Yeah, <laughs> through a screen. That's the, where we're at today. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's mm -hmm. better. It's, yeah. It's, it's a, the time of day when you move from your coffee to, to wine is always a good, a good time. <laughs> It's pretty hot for you, yeah. I know. It's easier for me. It's uh, lunchtime, or dinner time, so it's it, fine. Oh, it's fine. it's not it's not difficult for me. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> um, so this is this is delicious. Um, what, what was the 2017 vintage like? That was uh, um, one of the driest, and, uh, one of the driest and quite hot. As I mentioned, we 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 finished on uh, the 12th of September, which is just crazy. Honestly, and that's one of the changes is that sometimes we could have springs that are quite mild or okay. 
so not too early. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the, the summer is so uh, hot. I, sometimes I'm wondering because we do, I don't have the feeling of 17 being that hot. No? Uh, it doesn't taste like, like it. Yeah, that, that was not, but the, the, that was very, very uh, sunny and lightly. And you have the feeling that uh, uh, the, the, the sun is pairing up everything. Maturity, concentration, very, very, very quickly. And it uh, makes things uh, probably a little bit harder for us to, uh, to find a good balance, you know, not to uh, overtake a, a limit. Uh, um, I've, I've never um, had any interest for uh, uh, over rightness. Right. But the fact is, it's pretty hard now not to, to, to pass a certain time, you know, where you, you taste the grapes. So analysis are useful, but we don't care about analysis. What is very, very important is tasting the grapes and they, oh, 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 we, we should go. And you, look at the, you, you, you just look at the, the analysis and you say, well, maybe we should wait. No, we don't have to wait. The tasting says we have to go. So it's very, very important to, to, to do that. And... Uh, 17 was a bit special, yeah, very, very dry. We had the, some hail in the spring uh, on, uh, on part of La Mingua, on larger part of La Letière, and uh, on some other, another part. So small crop, very, very small crop. Um, the pour Lulu, the, the cuvée pour Lulu is uh, the, what we call cuvée classique usually, and we, we made a special tribute to, for, for Lulu. Mm -hmm. And people will see that there is a... Uh, uh, on filigrane, I don't know if you say that in English, you know, and okay. there is a, a swing on the label. There oh, yeah. A swing on the label. And um, that was, yeah, a very, very specific vintage, dry, small yields, mm -hmm. but that was very, very important to be able to do that. And the funny thing is that the Paul Lulu, at the beginning, you know, was... Uh, even when aging, even after nearly 18 months of, 18 months of aging, when it was still in vats, the wine was, uh, you know, uh, one side here, one side here, bam, bam, bam. And nothing was really, really uh, integrated. <laughs> and it, it's coming. My feeling is that the wine has changed and it's becoming very, very uh, uh, more approachable than it was yeah. uh, a couple of months ago. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. I think it's... Um, I and I think it's going to be an interesting one, despite the, 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 the richness of the vintage. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had this uh, two, three months ago, when, um, yeah, a little while back, and it was, it was a lot more uh, rugged. And, yeah. And a, a little, maybe even a hint of reduction, and now it's totally opened up and more uh, integrated, a lot more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if you ever forgot, which is not very easy, but if you ever forgot the... Uh, uh, Forget a, I forgot a bottle somewhere uh, open. It's it's uh, it's lasting quite long now. Um, oh really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like really interesting. Um, on some vintages, you know, like fifteen or maybe oh nine. Uh, these ones, you had the feeling that they, they they were moving to something a bit not oxidized, you know, but with some evolution in the mm -hmm. in the glass. Mm -hmm. uh, a bit too quickly, to my opinion, for a tempeh. And 17, yep. that was the vintage that was looking a little bit like this, is, is quite stable when, uh, when open, which is a good point. I mean, one, thing, one thing I really like about Tampier that you've preserved from, um, from Lucien is uh, you leave a bit of gas in the wine. Yeah. It's not sparkling. <laughs> That's one of the There's a little bit of CO2, okay. and that, I think that yeah. livens it up a little bit. It gives it a little bit of uh, peps, like we say in French, on the palate. Yeah. Um, when I first joined the, the, the domain, you know, the, you, you remember Annick? She, she stayed uh, working with Lucien Lulu and after mm -hmm. that with me uh, for about 40 years on the yeah. property. So she knows everything, she knows all the clients. And she, she told me a story about people, you know, in the, I can't remember the details, uh, but people were uh, calling and, and claiming, well, listen, your one is having too much gas, it's, it's fermenting. And, and uh, so I, uh, Annick was explaining, well, listen, you know, that's the way the wines are at Tempier. You must let them have some air or some time and it's going to be okay. And blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But people, 
they wouldn't listen to to Annick. So Monsieur Perrault, Lucien was uh, was saying, listen, Annick, give me the phone call, and he was speaking to the people and say, you don't know the ones, you bring them back. You don't understand, it's no need. Oh. <laughs> and because Lucien, when he thought that the wines were okay, that's okay. That's the way they should be. And we try to keep going on because I don't want to move, you know, if the wines are uh, aging and ending their aging with a high level of gas, mm -hmm. I don't want to move them to low them down to a level that is going to make them approachable, but not representative of what they are. Right. So they are going to lose gas, but they are going to be what they are. So some people have been uh, complaining about that, for example, in a vintage like 16. Because 16 huh. is with a very high level of gas. For reds, yeah. it's very, very high. I don't mind about that. You don't mind about that. And I guess it's going to be a incredible vintage for, for yeah. 18. It, so, it, I think it's definitely, I mean, it's, it's better to have CO2 than SO2 in the wine. Yes. Yeah. So you, you can reduce the amount of SO2 by adding or by bottling with a little bit of CO2. That's great. And then That's if good. anybody doesn't like that, if they don't like the effect it has on the palate, we know from when, from when we've been little that if, you, if there's too much gas, you just shake it up a little bit. Or you can exactly. it, swirl it around yeah. in for a minute and then it's gone. And, and shake the decanter. Shake no the decanter. Risk, especially yeah. with Mouet. Especially with Mouet, you don't, you, no problem. Even if the wines are old, they are a bit too, too stinky, they are a bit too, too funky. Yeah. No worries, just shake the decanter. You will see yeah. it's okay. Oh, it's more elegant and more approachable and mm -hmm. fruity. It's yeah, really important. Bedroom loves air, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. uh, let's see if we have exactly. some questions. I think we I saw some questions coming okay. since earlier. Um, if anybody does have any questions for Daniel, this would be the time. Uh, I'm not looking too much to the question I should have. Um, Ah, what kind of glass do you like to use for your reds? Is that a Zalto you're using? Yeah, that's it. That's Classy. Zalto with, uh, Zalto with Tampier. That's a, that's a collector's item right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love Zalto. It's, um, well, good glass uh, with... Um, Small buvon. The, the form of the, the glass with Morven, I don't know if it's. Um, I quite like this one. This one's a bit big, but uh, I quite like this one. This one's here for the, 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 the penis, mm -hmm. the glass. Um, I love this. this one. Uh, but I need to wash them by myself, of course. Oof, that's the hardest part. Nobody, <laughs> nobody wants to, to, to wash them. No. I have a concrete floor and I, I've, I've dropped some, and it's just it's an explosion. Yeah, exactly. But uh, definitely worth it if you're if you're willing to wash it. What about um, this question from Rory? What are you eating with old reds versus new ones? Um, uh, sorry, what, what's the the question? What are you eating? What kind of foods are you pairing with old old wines versus new wines from Tampier? Oh, 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 so many things. Uh, new ones, of course, it needs for me. It needs something like uh, if. Let's like say like barbecue. I mean, red meat because um, this sort of meaty, iron feeling that you could have with young red, full of fruit, but still strong and a bit crunchy as we were speaking yeah. earlier. This is yeah. You need to have some some um, why not barbecue? You know, my grilled grilled, grilled uh, beef or or, or, or uh, lamb, of course. But then when they, uh, when aging, uh, I prefer them with something a little bit more complex. You need complexity also in what you are eating. Of course, Lulu, the tradition, Lulu, the traditional Lulu cooking is lamb, you know, on the uh, Picel, which yeah. is marvelous. Or also, she's cooking it with uh, um, tapenade. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you, you know what is tapenade? The lamb is coated in tapenade. Yeah, exactly. That's just amazing. And uh, that's one of the recipe of Lulu that, uh, that is really, really amazing. And uh, yeah. also, uh, um, 
when in the middle, it's really interesting sometimes if you could uh, try, I uh, quite like them with, uh, with uh, Rouget. How do you call Rouget in English? Rouget, uh, I don't know. It's a small red fish. From Mediterranean. Very, very tasty that you don't empty. You just, you just cook it uh, entirely on the inside, oh. so it's quite strong. It's a striped red mullet. That's, uh, that's, that could be very, very interesting with, uh, with uh, 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 quite young red. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's a good, good way to have them. Of course, you could very, very young, you could have them with the uh, uh, soup de poulpe. Mm -hmm. If you want to, to make it in a more different way. Um, There's, Lulu has a great recipe for that. Yeah, 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 she does. Stew, it's very, I think it's very dark, kind of inky. There's tomato, there's... Mm -hmm. Very, very inky. A lot of garlic. <laughs> oh, everywhere. So, um, you, you, your partner need to eat garlic too. So. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you, you have to. <laughs> uh, sure. One of my favorites, yeah, is when, when uh, Tampier Vendol Rouge is young, is to have it cold with fish during the summer. Yeah. And it, it's, it's counterintuitive because tannic red wines, are, you generally don't serve them cold, but Something like this, you could you could even serve out of an ice bucket and have a you know, like a grilled uh, loup. Uh, yeah. Is, um, uh, sea bass. Sea bass, yeah. Grilled sea bass with a uh, chilled tempeh rouge. The fruit yeah. just completely is it, you know electric. It's perfect. That's that's the good way. Yeah. yeah <laughs> that's. You know, that's one of the things that we do in restaurants here more of the time. You know, you, you, you pull out the rosé and the white out from the, the cooler because they are too, too, too cold. Mm -hmm. and, and you put the red in the cooler because it's far away too, too, too hot. Mm -hmm. And then after, the red is becoming more interesting, of course. And you could, you could have it with the, with the fish. Yeah, you're right. Right. Um, I saw some other questions uh, asking, what, what are your favorite vintages? So... I'm curious, what are your, what's your favorite vintage that you've vinified? And um, I guess let's start there. Well, my, 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 answer to, to, my answer to that question is, uh, which kid do you prefer? <laughs> I don't have, um, for me, you know, I'm, I'm as, as a winemaker, if if that makes any sense for us, because there's no there's no word in French for winemaker, and I'm not the winemaker. I have a very good team with me, and I'm taking some decisions. But we are taking decisions all together. Right. And it's, so it's winemaking, yeah, of course, but it doesn't matter. As a, to that point of view, you know, for me, we know on some vintages we had we have made some mistakes. We are not very happy with what we have done. So it could be a great vintage and we are not that happy. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, sometimes you have crazy vintages that are very, very hard. And when you see the result, you say, wow, what's that? And I love that. And for example, 2012 was not considered as a great vintage. I love the wines. They are just fabulous for me. It's probably the best one just right now. Yeah. Um, and, but if you ask people that are going ranking one, they are going to say, well, no, 12 is not very interesting. Right. 11 is far away better. 16 or maybe 15 is better. Um, no. Right now, the best is 12. That's it. Yeah. And for, for aging, maybe it's going to be different. But uh, I think, you know, even... And what, uh, what surprised me the most when, when joining Tampier and you know, tasting the wine on small vintages, of course, we don't expect that much from these vintages. So maybe you are you are uh, not that objective when tasting them because you don't expect too much. But when you taste them and you say, "Wow, that's just so good," and it's supposed to be a bad vintage, wow. Well, another thing I've noticed uh, talking with uh, Vigneron is is that if you ask what's your favorite vintage, they'll often tell you what the easiest one was. So, I, like a really difficult vintage, like 2018, you'd say, "Oh, God, I hated 2018," because it was a, you know, it was a really challenging. But uh, um, yeah. that doesn't have it doesn't really have any any impact on 
what the result is. It could be a really, a really challenging vintage that you made beautiful wines, or it could be a really easy vintage that made sort of boring wines or less complex or, you know, who knows. So um, the, the, the vigneron's experience is much, much different than the, than the person who's getting the bottle at home because you've been, you were there from, from the start. You, you were there for the whole year in, in the vines, in the cellar, following the wine from as it grapes to, to bottle. And all, and all the things the bottle. <laughs> So for me, I'd like to I'd like to be able to rank the you know the our drug in fact uh, how we have been efficient and that's that could be the most interesting for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, I could tell you which are the vintage I don't like. <laughs> all three, all three, all three. Nine. Yeah. And all you know three. why? Because of the yeah, all three. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty challenging. That was, I haven't had, yeah, 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 maybe, maybe in, the, in Red Burgundy, there are some really good O3s that are starting to open up now. But, but I'm always so saying that, but when you taste the Templier, even when people are opening me a blind taste O3 Templier, I say, well, that's not bad. That's quite interesting. And they say, come on, you said it's, you don't like the vintage. Of course, but then I don't know. I don't know the vintage. I find it quite approachable and it's fine. They are not the kind of vintage that I really appreciate, you know? Right, right. And 2018 is, uh, is going to be, uh, I think, great fun. Yeah. Obviously, it's not a great wine. It's not for aging. But this is going to be quite drinkable, I think. <laughs> Easy. That's good. You need some of those, too. Yeah. That's <laughs> purpose. What about 2019? Uh, you mentioned dry. But uh, crazy vintage for uh, it's it's one of the the, the most amazing uh, I vinified in Bondol and at Tompier because uh, um, we started with uh, with um, um, uh, normal um, spring even cool so we were very late and if you has if you have passed us uh, end of June, when, when are we going to start harvesting? Mm -hmm. I think in the team, everybody would have tell you, well, it's not possible to start before the, of the 10th of September. And we started in August. Because um, late August, I think we started on 27 or 28, I can't, can't remember. But uh, um, that was, again, so lightly and so odd. But, same, I didn't have the feeling of a very, very hot season. Not like O3, not like uh, maybe uh, you know, no, not so hot yeah. for me, even 11. Um, but the, the fact was that the rightness was very, very early. Mm -hmm. uh, rushing, in fact, sort of rushing. And despite this, probably because of a very, very cool um, spring with Good reserves of water. Yeah. It's uh, an incredibly f fresh vintage. So, okay. I, yeah, it's looking a bit like, the balance is looking a bit like wines from the 90s in some times, you know? Uh -huh. So it's really, really interesting. Right. Great. Um, well, I'm, I'm really, really, uh, uh, what could you say? I, I really, I, I really, uh, wait to see what's going on with this vintage when, when it's going to be older and after these 18, 20 months of aging, I'm, mm. uh, I'm waiting for that to see how it's going to express itself. Yeah. It's really important really for me. We'll have to be patient. <laughs> yeah. uh, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, I saw an interesting one. Somebody asked, uh, what are your favorite non tompier wines to drink? Favorite producers or appellations or wines that, that you drink outside of outside of your own? Everything that is good and respecting the place where it's coming from. Uh, I don't mind about that. I'm a great fan about you mentioned, of course, uh, <laughs> a, a large part of your, your portfolio is quite interesting for me. <laughs> and uh, most of them are good friends, so uh, we yeah. make a change, but... It could be. It, it could come wherever it come, comes from. Uh, um, and mine, as fine as it is, uh, respecting the place where it's coming from, balance, 
fresh enough. It's okay. So uh, uh, I don't have any precise, of course. I could tell you which have been the ones that have impressed me the most when being young and you know driving me to something. You you have uh, you have sort of a, a line you could follow like this, but there are still so so many ones that are. Just lovely, you know, and you don't have to mention that, of course, that was uh, the Domain of Verna uh, this year. That was just fabulous. Yeah. Uh, had some, some just fabulous moments with Beaujolais, and that was, the moment was more important than whatever happened, whatever right. you could put inside of, of the wines. And uh, great wines were um, uh, Jalon, you know, uh, steps to help to help me uh, approaching what, what could be a, sort of a goal, you know? Yeah. But uh, in the same time, um, we were speaking about that. Wine is about sharing, sharing uh, uh, emotion, uh, feelings. And with that, you need good wines, good wines that you could drink. Right. Not, not big ones that are going to be very interesting when in description and tasting, but in the sure. Sure. good ones, real ones. So yeah. I don't mind. My favorite for the moment, you know, one of my favorite for the moment is, uh, is uh, I love uh, Certico. The great, Sorry. Great, the, oh, it's Certico. It's mm -hmm. just fabulous. I love this great. From Atsidakis, fortunately he died, but the ones, they were just amazing. I mean, that mm -hmm. was fabulous wines. You mentioned Corsican wines, the wines yeah. from uh, from uh, Yves Canarelli. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 you could Andre Sortag, Andre has, has been a very very uh, um, he has been a sort of a, a, a you know a, a drive. I don't know what you call that in English. You know, a sort of a, a guide. In, uh, in some aspects of the wine, it's very, very important. So uh -huh. when I taste the wine, I always remember what we, we have shared. Uh, I love some champagne, because you know, champagne is not known as being the region that is really concerned about what's going on in two developments. Yeah. And, uh, but there are still some big changes there, and you, have, you could taste crazy wines from, from there. You have tasted some fabulous wines from California, so yeah. I, don't, I don't mind. I don't care where it's coming from as far as this uh, balance and respecting the place where it's coming from. Okay. Well, that's a good note to end. Um, that's, I think you described your, uh, your Bondol 2017 perfectly well. Yeah. It's a wine to be shared. Um, it's delicious. We actually, uh, it's, we have it available on our website right now for anybody who's uh, confined and, and needs a drink. Uh, Shop.kermitlinch.com. We have Daniel's uh, 2017. Um, looks like they're going to cut us off, so we have to go. But I want to thank Daniel Ravier, uh, Domaine Tampier, for, for joining. Um, thanks, everybody, who watched. And I uh, hope, hope you stay safe. Um, hope the whole team is safe. Everybody, everybody's well. Keep, <laughs> Keep safe, yeah. Take care of everybody around you. And uh, thank you, Tonio, for that. Thank you, Daniel. Stay safe and drink Pandol. Cheers. Santé. Santé. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.